Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Telemark Your Ski Jumping Podcast. Luis Holoch says thank you for tuning in, especially to those who just discovered this project. So make sure to subscribe to your feed and follow all of the social media. Links are in the show notes and in the description. Since we are having quite calm days related to real news, I decided to take one step back and have just one last flashback on the past season. So therefore I will just fly over the lady ski jumping season analysis I did for skispringen.com and that is in the show notes and in the description as well. So let us start with... I guess there is no doubt about the fact that Marlon Lütby once again rocked this season. 12 World Cup victories, second most in just a single season behind Zara Takanashi's 14 in the season 13-14 and seven additional World Cup podiums were her stats in this phenomenal season where she defended her overall World Cup title. She also crowned herself as the first ever Raw Air winner as well as World Champion in Seefeld in the individual. And in addition to that, she also won two times bronze in team and mixed team. So a tendency in journalism to explain something these days is typically asking, was it this or was it that? Um, I personally believe that everyone that did sport on a certain level knows that there is not just one single thing, just one key to success. In Martin's case, it's actually a combination of lots of things. Believe it or not, in an age of 24, it's also experience. She already jumped at the World Champs in 2009 in the age of only 14 and made her way to the top, step by step. It is also mental strength that she gained, especially after tough moments. Perfectly expressed by how she won the Olympics 2018. One year before, we all remember that, she was already leading at halftime of the World Championships in Lahti lost it a bit in the second round and only became fourth. And that was really tough for her. Only a couple of hours before her Olympic win, she crashed and still thought back. And also this time she struggled. She had a badass landing in the team competition just the day before, but she stayed cool in the competition then. Other than that, a real fun fact is the following. She set the longest jump a female ski jumper ever did in an official FIS competition. She made it look easy, although it surely was not, as she told me in Oberstdorf, as well as speaking about her own strength. You don't get tired of saying that uh, the competition with uh, especially the German girls is what makes you so strong, even though you still make it look easy, <laughs> although it's obviously hard work. Um, Is there even more which is making you strong besides this competition? More? Like, like uh, any other aspect you would say that makes you strong? Um, well, I think I have some strong... Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, what is it called? Uh, strong uh, abilities? Or, mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, I am able to push hard at the table. And also the aerodynamics in the flights. I think it's... When I make my best jumps, uh, I have a really nice um, curve in the, in, the, in the air, so mm -hmm. I think that is uh, some of my best uh, capabilities. Okay. Uh, I don't know what it's called. Skills. Skills. <laughs> yeah, a real fun thing to do as a journalist is also talking to the same athletes before the actual season and having a look how their approaches turned out. And uh, in Martin's case, we were definitely smarter after than before. Her successes were basically also thanks to her different training concept in the summer. I had uh, 150 jumps so far. So last year I had almost uh, 300 and the year before I had uh, 400 to 500. So uh, less, less than what, what, why did this different approach? Did, did you feel after your past season that you needed to change something? Or how? Uh, I feel like yeah, this change can make me better uh, in the winter. 
during the summer you do a lot of jumps and I think it's hard to keep uh, quality in each jump. Yeah. So I invested more in strength training and uh, power training for So I hope I can stay in a good shape during the whole uh, season. And once again there's no doubt about that this definitely worked out for her she was consistent all over the season and uh, once again i already speak about her we surely should not forget about the side story this song which is playing uh, in the background and also connected uh, to that music video uh, they shoot it for it uh, which was definitely bizarre uh, but probably ironic um, we should uh, ask her about it one time in the future although this is clearly not uh, my strongest discipline i have to admit but believe it or not even in her case there was something that actually did not change and we also spoke about that and um, did this past season change something on your complete mindset or are you still the same person and jumper like before uh, i hope so <laughs> well i didn't notice any difference so i would like to know how it's from your view i hope it's uh, i hope i'm the same and i think I still uh, want to achieve a lot of things and uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to the winter because I like jumping in winter uh, even better. Transition incoming... Ah, just kidding. But uh, not Quite a long time ago, Stefan Kraft and Michael Heiberg actually were considered as the most successful double room in ski jumping. Um, now you might ask yourself, what does this got to do with lady ski jumping? Well, actually it is very simple. There is a new magnificent duo that also shares a double room on the road. And of course I am talking about the jumpers on number 2 and 3 in the overall World Cup, Katharina Althaus and Juliane Seifert. What a great season they both had as well. Althaus became double world champion in team and mixed and won the silver in the individual, just half a point, a bit unlucky to be fair, behind Lundby. But I use the word one on purpose due to the fact that she's looking at it the same way. Moreover, she scored three World Cup victories, one in Lillehammer on the large hill and two in Prémonant and ten additional podiums. Another massive achievement is the following. She is the only jumper to always jump top 10 in all 24 competitions. And right in the beginning of the season, she repeated her triumph in the Lillehammer Triple, so she managed to win again in Maren Lundby's home ground. And it all started by winning both COCs in Oslo and following that the COC summer overall, so she had another strong year. Juliane Seifert's success came a bit more surprising, but was really astonishing. She finished the season of her life with the victory in the first ever Bluebird Tour in Russia, by winning three of the four competitions in there. She gained 13 World Cup podiums, including four victories, the first one at the opening, and she also wore the yellow bib for the second competition then, and became double world champion in team and mixed as well. She is now 29 years of age and yet another proof for claiming the years around the 30 as the best period in an athlete's life. Other than that, she is one of the left pioneers of lady ski jumping, staying patient and now rewarded herself for a massive progress in being an athlete. It will be really interesting to see if she can even top this in the next season. Speaking of pioneers, we are coming to one athlete who always deserves an award for her life work. She always fought back after several injuries and shows that age is just a number. Of course, I'm talking about the one and only Daniela Eraschko Stolz. She landed a massive comeback to the World Championships after a one-month break due to a pneumonia and even in the individual competition in Seefeld itself because she came fourth from the eighth place with eight points behind the podium and yet made it to the third place. Incredible. On top came two times silver in mixed and also in the ladies team. A Cinderella story if you want to tell it like this. The oldest jumper on the circuit in her home country and even in a competition that was not actually in the program but she really did fight for. Although she's pretty much never happy about her own jumps, she managed to get three World Cup victories in Oslo, Sao and Sapporo and an additional third place in Lillehammer 
on the larger during the triple. Not too bad, as she would probably say. And now to the second indestructible. Okay, um, where to start and where to end, actually? Probably by the name. I am talking about Eva Pinkelnik. She came in 6th place and so was the best Austrian in the overall World Cup, including two third places in Trondheim and Lillehammer. Before that, she collected four fourth places and yet it was all smiles for the Austrian. The most amazing week, she said, was still her home World Championships in Seefeld. 5th place in the individual and also two times silver in team and mixed team. Nobody expected that before. Some now may say, well, she is in the same status as in her debut season 2014-2015. But, let me tell you, totally under different circumstances. She has had two massive crashes and suffered from neuronal issues afterwards. And it took quite some time to get over it, but with patience and help from lots of good people, she fought back. I recommend you to read my interview with her on skispringen.com, even though it is in German, but... It was indeed very impressive, but also made a lot of fun. Do you guys know that feeling when you do something just for fun and out of curiosity and suddenly it turns out it is a real hit? Well, I exactly had this with my intuitive interview with Anna Odine Ström at the Summer Grand Prix final in Klingenthal. Too bad the comp has actually been cancelled due to weather conditions, but the time I invested on that quality day has been phenomenal. Here you can have a listen to our short interview. Uh, I try to have the same process earlier. Uh, I still I have done a lot of hard work to get where I am, but I have to work even harder to get further. Uh, so I just keep working in the results to come hopefully if they don't. I just have to keep working in the video. Yeah. Do you expect that it's going to be a bit more difficult uh, in the winter since there are some athletes uh, coming additionally who have been jumping in the summer? Of course it's going to be harder. Uh, everyone's usually better in the winter. Mm -hmm. But I'll just have to do my best and at the end of the competition we'll, we'll see where I, I am. So what do we actually learn from this? Obviously, Norwegians stick to their words and uh, as well as her teammate Maru Lindby, she obviously followed hers. Her impressive stats are two World Cup podiums. As we all remember, second in Zao, only 0.2 points behind Lundby and third in Nishni Tagil. Overall, she was seventh in the World Cup, including 17 top 10 results. Ten of them were in a row. And on top came two-time bronze with the team and mixed in Seefeld. Before the season, I already called her a secret shooting star because of her great uh, summer results and she even managed to top that. But still, my choice of words was good enough for the commentator of the German TV ZDF, so he made this one his own already at the Lillehammer Triple and even denied he copied this after I confronted him with this fact. But uh, it was very obvious if you speak German and compare my article to his words in the live coverage. And my article was published way before his coverage. But anyhow, what fascinates me of her is her unreal in-run speed. She is always on the top in these stats and set the fastest in-run speed in Nillehammer with an incredible 97.3 km per hour. Now we can say, luckily, luckily, the police is not placing any speed traps there, otherwise she probably would be in trouble. On to the next surprise, Lydia Yakovleva. I bet some of you have not heard that name before, and honestly, even to me, it was a very big surprise. She started out with her first ever World Cup victory on just the second day of the season, her third World Cup attendance ever. And you can really say that came out of nowhere. She achieved another 9 top 10 results and became twice junior world champion in the team and in the mixed. And also vice world champion, if you want to call it that, in the individual just behind teammate Anna Spunjeva, who had a great season as well. So everyone, including myself, who was wondering on how the Russian team would perform without Irina Avakumova, who surprisingly jumped more than we all thought before, now knows 
they did good. Really good. And the same actually goes for Team Italy, even though they had to jump without Manuela Malzina. They even managed to reach the final round at the premiere of the team competition in Seefeld with one naughty combined athlete, so shout out to Veronica Gianmuena at this point, and also to Giada Tomaselli, a clear rookie that came into world class ski jumping just after two FIS Cups, of which she won one, and the second finished second. Not too bad. Lara Malzina beat her best World Cup result twice and now has a sixth place from Nishita Gil in her books. I asked her how she did that after a horrible, her own words actually, first training jump only a couple of hours before and she just laughed. I just thought it happens always like this, so I did exactly that. With probably the shortest and less intensive preparation for ever, or at least for quite a long time, Elena Rungadir came into the second after an ankle injury, which was more complicated than anyone thought before. But she managed to achieve to visit the top 10 twice again in the winter, three years after her last time. And so she was extremely happy with her season and thanked everyone for the support. Sounds reasonable. And on to the non-European teams. Well, there's not much to say actually. Canada suffered from bad luck in form of injuries and crashes, which even forced the last representative, Natalie Eilers, who scored the only points for Canada this season, to quit exactly this season earlier. She crashed in Planitza during her preparation for the raw air and even was afraid to undergo a possible surgery. Luckily, the damage was not too bad and she could cure conservatively. The USA had no real leader after the voluntary break of Sarah Hendrickson, who got re-elected as athletes representative and is set to make a comeback the latest in the winter. And so there was Nita England that did not reach the same level of the seasons before. Tara Gareth Demotes, who mainly focused on Nordic Combined and missed the points in each attempt. Now she only focuses on Nordic Combined and wants to continue her leadership, where she started last season by winning 10 out of 10 Continental Cups. Logan Sankey had a difficult injury in the summer and just made her comeback as well as Nina Lucy, who at least was able to score a couple of points. She was on a good way before she tore her ACL at the Olympic Triads, so hopefully she can get back there and finish what she started. Obviously, it is easier to explain what happened to those two nations, but not really for Japan. Sara Takanashi finished outside of the top 3 in the overall World Cup for the first time ever. But since she changed her jumping style in the summer completely, you could not really criticize her for her results. Also, Nozomi Maruyama did a really great job by finishing 20th in the overall ranking. But I could not explain what happened to Yuki Ito. She was kinda close in the summer, but her winter was close to bad. Even the Japanese Federation was not satisfied and did not nominate her for the World Cup in Ryshnov. Her best results was a fifth place in Oberstdorf. Simply not enough for her ambitions. And it is not clear how she will continue. If we now take a closer look to the competitor field, we happily recognize there are no retirements announced up until now for the first time ever since the World Cup was established. Still, it was hurtful to see so many injuries, especially all the torn ACLs. It even started before the season with Manuela Mazina from Italy, who broke her knee. Luckily, she is back on skis again and ready to jump in June. The December has been pretty dark with Germany's Janina Ernst, who tore her ACL at the COC in Notodden, followed by Frida Westmann from Sweden during the training in Premanong and Emma Klinitz who crashed at the Large Hill Nationals in Planitza and got to know about her diagnosis on Christmas Eve. In January we heard about Abigail Strait of Canada and Julia Claire of France that both tore their ACLs and were done for the season as well. The final episode of this dark series was Ramona Straub's injury at Holmenkollen. She is one of four jumpers amongst those who are injured at the moment that already had this kind of injury before. I don't know about you, but for me the strangest thing about this is there is no real explanation for the mess of this injury, 
only theories. Some people say the knuckled binding bar could be a reason. That already started in 2010 when Simon Amman brought it up. During this season, the goddess jumpers put in their jumping boots got into the focus. Now, the good news is, with Julia Huber, Nina Lucy, Svenja Wirth, Ocean Avocagro and Luisa Görlich, five jumpers came back after knee injuries. Lucy and Wirth, as well as Avocagro, who had her third torn ACL, were able to collect World Cup points. Huber and Sankey were jumping in the World Cup again and Görlich jumped a few national competitions at the end of the season. Yeah, once again I have to go back to Marlon Lindby actually. She is the leader of Lady Ski Jumping, not only because of her performance on the hill, but also due to her media works. The clearest sign for that was her guest article on VG.no, where she wrote I dream of flying at Wickersundbakken, but I do not have any desire to only do show jumps in the break at the men's competition. Katharina Althaus basically said the same. She also hopes to be allowed to go ski flying in a few years. Interestingly, only about two years ago, a bit longer probably, Maren has told me this in a quick chat. And um, let's go, let's say, one step bigger, um, ski flying. I guess this is a dream of every woman ski jumper, right? Do you kind of feel ready for a ski flying hill or can't you really say that because you haven't been on one yet? Uh, I feel ready. I uh, actually want to jump the election in mm -hmm. uh, March, if it's possible. Yeah, yeah. as a try jumper. Yeah, if, oh. if I jump well and everything looks fine, I'm uh, okay. Uh, I, keep, I keep my fingers crossed this will if happen. They left me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the party that will be able to make a ski flying for the ladies happening in Wickersund is the Norwegian Ski Federation. And uh, they are obviously more unorthodox and progressive than any other ski federation, shown already with establishing the ladies raw air this past season. They made a step others did not or did not want to make. And so sporting director Klaus Brede Braten says, we would be interested in having a ladies ski flying in 2021 in Wickersund and in course of the raw air. Uh, we were thinking about this already and see possibly 10 to 15 ladies that would be able to jump the Wickersund Bakken already now. And even if there's just a continuous and not exponential development in ladies ski jumping, it is likely to double this number. So, what else is missing for this roundup? Oh yeah, I've almost forgot it. A statistical overview over this past season. So there were 26 World Cup competitions, 24 of them were individuals and two were team competitions, which were held on 15 ski jumps in 12 places in 8 different countries, which meant it was the longest season in the World Cup era. 99 participants from 19 nations took part of it and 58 of 15 different nations collected World Cup points. 13 jumpers of 9 nations jumped on the podium. And with Juliane Seifert, Lydia Jakovleva, Anna Odine Ström, Ramona Straub and Ursha Bogatai, five jumpers for the very first time. The first two of these won for the very first time and additionally scored their first podium ever with winning their competition. And seven different jumpers came on the second and 11 different on the third place. Except the team competitions in the World Cup and also in Seefeld, which all were won by German teams, the whole season had lots of different highlights and stars. Nevertheless, there is one thing that really bothers, the TV coverage. Of course, the quality of the coverage is totally subjective, a matter of taste you could say, but the quantity is not and therefore it is easier to evaluate. I can only speak for the German speaking area now, but especially in my home country it has been really disappointing once again. And this goes for public service broadcasting authorities and especially for private broadcasting stations, e.g. Eurosport. Also, we journalists rely on the TV coverage in case we are not on site, as we call it, which is mostly due to costs. And it is a big problem if there is no live feed while sitting at home and trying to do your job. 
Of course it is still nice for laggy ski jumping if there are highlight summaries later on, but these air a long time after our reports are online. And the perfect example for this dilemma was the raw air. Believe it or not, in Germany you could only watch the second round from Holmenkollen live. Before and afterwards there was literally no TV coverage. And this gets even stranger if you find out that Sportschau.de, the website for Germany's most famous sports show, offers a live ticker where a person gets to see the competition and following that posts a description of what happens. Why on earth do they not offer pictures for the public if they receive the world feed? And being in this state, we are way below Norway where Marlon Lundby once again says it hurts over and over again if our coverage is moved from TV to an online live stream. Just think about this. If we are going to this state, this would even mean we are progressing here in Germany. And that is just ridiculous in my eyes. The other thing that needs to be discussed is the prize money. And therefore Sarah Hendrickson, as I stated before, the representative for the athletes, recently stated Another goal of mine is to progress in equal price money to the men, as we make less than 30% of which they make. I have said it a hundred times, but I never want to take anything away from the male jumpers, as I idolize them greatly. But I was born female and we deserve the same opportunities. So let me explain you why Sarah is right and the price money for the women is actually really really wrong. Martin Lundby earned 35,000 euros for her raw air victory. To earn the same amount of money, she would have to win 14 World Cup competitions, since a World Cup win is worth 3,000 Swiss francs. One Swiss franc is 88 cents, so 100 are 87.91. She had 12 World Cup victories this season and earns 32,173 euros, which is still less than for this one tournament that basically consists of 9 jumps. And although some of money are before taxes, just to let you know. If you want to win 14 World Cup competitions, you usually go through 14 jumps, including qualifications. So just a comparison. A World Cup win for men is worth 10,000 Swiss francs, which is 8,936 euros. And even for that, a woman would need to win three World Cup competitions. So here's my conclusion. The raw air prize money set the bar. It set the bar for the future, so that female ski jumpers who train and live like professional athletes even get the chance to make a living from their sport. That would be the ultimate step additionally to what happened in the past season. So yeah, this is my summary for the season 2018 and 2019 and also for this episode of Telemark. And I hope you guys liked it. If so, subscribe to the RSS feed and my YouTube channel and get in touch with me on the social networks. Especially if you have ideas for the upcoming episodes. So I wish you all a very good time and see you soon. Bye bye.